So Resident Evil has been known to have many triumphant moments where our characters would overcome the obstacles that they had to face and eventually make it out alive to fight another day. While equally as there are many great and happy moments in this series, there are equally as many tragic and sad moments that occurred in this franchise, which in this video, we'll be covering the most tragic and sad deaths in Resident Evil, which would span the main title games and some side titles as well. So sit back and relax as we go through the timeline from the very beginning, which brings us to the events of Resident Evil Zero and the decimation of the Star's Bravo team. Because here, unbeknownst to them, they would be right in the middle of the T-Virus outbreak in the Arklay Mountains. Where as we progress through the game and leading up to Resident Evil 1, we see some members would be infected or be killed by a B.O.W. Which brings us here to Edward. Edward! Are you alright? What happened? It's worse than... we can't. You must be careful, Rebecca. The, the forest is full of z zombies and monsters. Zombies and monsters? Uh, uh. Though very short was our interaction with this character, it quickly sets up the premise of how ill-prepared the Star's Bravo team was during this game. Also the fact that he was the only one to be shown to have died in this manner in Resident Evil Zero. <laughs> Don't come any closer! Because the only other STARS member that got a little bit more screen time and would eventually also lose his life would be the leader of the Bravo team, Enrico Marini. Don't shoot! You're alive. Are you okay, Rebecca? Where is everybody? They should have arrived here before me. Haven't you seen them? That's unfortunate. If we go straight from here, we should arrive at an old mansion which Umbrella uses for research. Come on, let's go. Wait, I've got to find Billy. Billy Cohen? You mean you found that criminal? Yes, but we got separated and... No point worrying about him. He won't make it. Come on, let's go. Sir, please. I need to find him. Don't worry, I'll catch up with you. Rebecca, I... All right. Just be careful. I never saw him again. This would be a great segue to the events in Resident Evil 1, because here, as mentioned by Rebecca, that this would have been the last time that she sees Captain Marini. Well, in Resident Evil 1, he would be the one to figure out that there was a traitor amongst the STARS team, though in a last ditch effort to reveal who the perpetrator was, this happens. Is that you, Jill? Is that voice Enrico's? Yeah. You're alive! Stop! Are you with anybody, Jill? Barry. You alright? Hey, buddy. Someone is a traitor. The stars are finished. Umbrella set us up. <laughs> Damn it! Enrico! Also, just to make things clear, the death of Captain Marini is only one of several that happens in this game. Because as mentioned earlier, the Star's Bravo team was completely decimated during these events in RE0 and RE1. While the few remaining survivors from RE0 would also wind up in the Spencer Mansion. But to no avail, their luck would also run out eventually, with many of the Star's members losing their lives one way or another. Jill, don't scare me. Speak for yourself, Barry. What are you doing here? Yeah. Well, uh, I think you should take a look at this. I warn you, though, it's not pretty. It's forest. Oh, what could have done this to him? God only knows, but I'm gonna 
find out what did this to him. Richard! Chris! Chris, stop! No! Richard! And to me personally, I thought Joseph's death was pretty impactful. The fact that he was the one to set up the premise for the Stars Alpha team this time around, and how helpless they were when attacked by some of the Cerberuses in the area. Also, the added salt to the wound was the fact that their only means of escape was with Brad Vickers, who was the Stars team's pilot, who in a spur of panic decided to leave his comrades behind and fend for themselves against the many monsters and B.O.W.s in the game. Hey, Brad! Where the hell's he going? No! Don't go! Well, the next entry would be Resident Evil 2, which happens just a couple of months after the Spencer Mansion incident in Resident Evil 1, where we're introduced to a whole new cast of characters, Leon Kennedy, Claire Redfield, the sister of our main protagonist from RE1, Chris Redfield, and many side characters like Sherry Bergen, Ada Wong, Marvin Branagh, Ben Bartolucci, and Annette Bergen. Well, amongst these characters, some tragically lose their lives, with one of the more gruesome ones happening to Ben Bertolucci, a journalist who was digging up information in regards to the many conspiracies happening in Raccoon City. With one very important information he found out about was the crazy and evil Chief Irons, the police chief of the RPD station, who went AWOL and started to hunt down any remaining survivors in the RPD station. Well, in this case, Ben would lock himself up inside one of the jail cells, thinking that it would provide him with some type of protection. But as we find out, he was dead wrong. Let me guess, you must be Ben, right? Get up, now! What do you want? I'm trying to sleep here. Is this the guy? Ben, you told the city officials that you knew something about what's been going on, didn't you? What did you tell them? And who the heck are you? I'm trying to find my boyfriend. His name's John. He was working for a branch office of Umbrella based in Chicago, but he suddenly disappeared six months ago. I heard a rumor that he's here in the city. I don't know anything. And even if I did, why would I want to tell you? Okay, I say we leave him in there. Does anyone know where they put the key to this cell? I have it right here, officer. But I'm not about to leave this cell. Those zombies aren't the only things crawling around out there. What was that? Like I said, I'm not leaving this cell. Get out of here before you lead it right to me.
Though Ben's death was tragic, the one that really hit hard in this game was actually the supposed death of Ada Wong. Though at this time when playing scenario A, it gave the impression to the players that her betrayal to Leon and then eventually losing her life was something permanent. I believe this. Lynette was right. About everything. That's why I told you to leave without me, but you wouldn't listen. Now hand it over. Don't make me shoot you. You can't do that. Oh. Oh. Ada! Ada, I've got you. Don't give up. Gee. Shut up. You're gonna make it. It's too late, Leon. We both know it. No. I promised you that we would escape. You just have to help me out here. I... I really wanted to escape with you, Leon. Escape from everything. Though we get a small revelation that she did survive if playing scenario B, but still, even with this sad moment in the game, it was only this impactful due to her partnership with Leon and how the two bonded during this game. And if circumstances were different, I'm sure she would have turned out to be a very good protagonist instead of being this very mercurial character. Take care of yourself, Leon. No! Well, with that sad and tragic moment with Ada Wong in Resident Evil 2, let's go ahead and move on to Resident Evil 3, which chronologically happens one day before Resident Evil 2 and one day after. Also again this time around, we have Jill Valentine as the main protagonist as we follow her adventure of escaping Raccoon City. So while playing as her, like the previous Resident Evil games that we've mentioned so far, she would encounter many new characters, some recurring like Brad Vickers, but mostly the UBCS members, which the likes of Carlos, Nikolai, and Mikhail were introduced. But as the video topic suggests, we will cover the saddest and most tragic death in this game, which I could say that two different characters took on this role, with the first one happening to none other than Star's Alpha Team member Brad Vickers, the same guy who left the Star's team at the Arclay Mountains at the start of RE1, the guy who left his comrades to fend for themselves while just witnessing one of their own get mutilated by monsters. But in a moment of wanting revenge for leaving us behind in Resident Evil 1, he would be subject to one of the most iconic boss monster entrances in this franchise. <laughs> Just the fact that Brad was completely helpless in this moment just goes to show the gravity of the danger that Nemesis imposes to Jill Valentine. Because from her standpoint, the closest thing that she fought to something of Nemesis likeness was the tyrant at the end of RE1. But the fact that we get to see this sad moment with Brad being used as a catalyst of the ongoing pursuit of Nemesis for the rest of Resident Evil 3 was not just momentous, but absolutely amazing, yet still sad for Brad. Though in the next character in this game who in my opinion did go out in a literal blaze of glory, making his sacrifice a truly tragic and heroic moment during this game, which happens to be with Mikhail and his battle against Nemesis inside the cable car, with this last effort from the mercenary happening due to him wanting Jill and Carlos to escape, even though he knew he was already gravely injured prior to his introduction in both versions of RE3. Speaking of both versions, which final stand against Nemesis was better, the original or the RE3 Remakes version. Please let me know in the comment section down below.
don't really think a pencil pusher like Barton is still alive, do you? I have a done good authority. Why? Are you worried about teammates? Or something else? Funny how brainless zombies can ambush a platoon like that. Funny the gate was locked. Don't you think? <laughs> How is this fucker not dead yet? Just no, they're gone. Come, this way. Nikolai, what are you doing? It's not after you. <laughs> Get off my train, shit bird! Though with this heroic final act from Mikhail, Nemesis would still be able to pursue Jill to the Clock Tower area, but if it wasn't for his effort against Nemesis, who knows what could have happened to our main protagonist in this game. But with Resident Evil 3 covered, the major plot point of the T-Virus outbreak in Raccoon City already over, this only leads us to the events in Resident Evil Code Veronica, which if you guys have never played this game, we again have a recurring star character reprising her role, with Claire Redfield taking on center stage, but this time around, she would be partnered up with Steve Burnside, a fellow inmate of Rockford Island. Uh, sorry about that little misunderstanding. But I thought you were another one of those mod- Shut up! Make one wrong move and I'll shoot! Relax, beautiful. I said I was sore. My name's Steve. I was a prisoner on this island. Which here, both characters would work together as they fight another bout of the T-Virus outbreak, but also the constant meddling of the Ashford twins, especially Alfred Ashford. Well, to put things in context, the partnership between Claire and Steve does end up fruitful since they do make it out alive from the island, though their adventures would not end here as they still would bond during this game. Well, following this video topic, as we know by now, Steve was an important character and a very good partner for Claire. With the two going through so much already in this game, it only makes this event even more sorrowful when it happens. With Steve captured and infected with the T Veronica virus, turning him into a monster that would chase after Claire. Steve? Oh, Claire. crazy woman told me she was going to perform the same experiment on me that she did on her own father. She's completely insane. Uh, uh, huh? 
What's wrong? Claire! Get... Breathe! Claire! Help me! Claire! But that would be short-lived because through a miraculous last-second relapse of consciousness, we get this. Steve, you've got to hang in there, okay? Uh, my brother's come to save us. We're getting out of here. Your... brother kept his promise. I'm sorry, I cannot. What? What are you saying? I'm glad that I met you. I... I love you. While following the events of Resident Evil Code Veronica, and having Claire Redfield as the lead protagonist of this game, we can only move on to the next installment in this franchise, which would be in Resident Evil 4, and funny enough, the character that would be the main protagonist in this game would be Claire's old partner from RE2, Leon Kennedy. Oh, la campana. Es hora de rezar. Tenemos que irnos. Sattler. Where's everyone going? Bingo? Well, similar to the trend that we've covered in this video so far, as mentioned previously, Leon would encounter many different characters, many new but one familiar one, but the tragic or sad death that happens in this game would occur to the side character, Luis Serra. Though not having the same amount of screen time that Steve had from the previous Resident Evil installments that we just covered, here Luis was a good ally to Leon, assisting him when he was cornered by the mass of enemies, but his end would happen in the first half of the game. Leon! I got it. Lewis! I have 
at the sample. You serve me no purpose. Sadler! My boy Salazar will make sure you follow the same fate. Stay with me, Lois. I am a researcher, hired by Sadler. He found out what I was up to. <laughs> Don't talk. Here. It should suppress growth of the parasite. The sample. Sadler took it. You have to get it back. Lois! Lois! Though as we find out, Lewis was actually a former researcher for the main antagonist Osman Sandler, but has decided to change course and oppose his use of the Las Plagas parasite so prominent in Resident Evil 4. Look, I know you're carriers. You've been coughing up blood, right? Yeah. And you? Yes. Damn it! The eggs have hatched. We don't have much time. What are you talking about? I have to go back and get it. Let me come with you. No. You stay here with Leon. He is better with the ladies. I'm sure. Why are you... It makes me feel better. Let's just leave it at that. But after the events of Resident Evil 4, this now only brings us to the storyline of Resident Evil 5. But this time around, instead of a tragic and sad death from one of the protagonists in this game, here we have an antagonist who was manipulated and turned into a monster by her so-called partner, which this game did a very strong emphasis on, with Chris Redfield again taking on the lead role and partnered up with another member of the BSAA, Sheva Alamar. The two would make their way and fight against new breeds of enemies and and BOWs, with the Ouroboros being the main catalyst as causing the catastrophe in the surrounding area in Africa. Well, as mentioned earlier, it's not Chris nor Sheva that tragically passes away in this game. Instead, one of the villains is actually the one who takes a cake this time around, with Excella Hioni being the character that's tragically killed by the Ouroboros virus. And what's worse is that it was her own partner that caused this moment to happen to her. What's going on? Why? When I've done so much. All for you. Chris, how nice of you to join us. Wesker. Don't worry. Your mission is at its end. Ouroboros is on the eve of its appearance. Six billion cries of agony will burn a new balance. Sorry, Wesker, but not on my watch. Albert, you said we change this world together. Oh, why? I thought they were partners. Wesker doesn't give a damn about anybody but himself. Soon, even you will understand, Chris. One glimpse of my new world, and it will all make perfect sense. Show yourself! Unfortunately, it's too late for you. You will not live to see the dawn. Sorry, Excella, but it appears Ouroboros has rejected you. Though you have been an excellent asset, I have one last task for you. Uh, Albert! Was revealed, Albert Wesker. Yes, the same Albert Wesker who was also the traitor of the Stars team in Resident Evil 1, again reprises his role of backstabbing his own comrades. This of course happened due to his pursuit of becoming a god, even sacrificing those who cared for him without any kind of remorse. With this event of Excellus mutation supporting Albert's crazy ideals and showing the lengths he would go to just to achieve his goals. Also on a quick side note, we do get a small flashback event covering the sad fate of Oswald E. Spencer, one of the founding members of the Umbrella Corporation. 
Well, he too had a vision of becoming a god, but the irony in this case was that he was killed by Albert Wesker, who at the time displayed superhuman-like powers that may be comparable to a godlike character. With the irony of this moment shows how weak Spencer was at this point of his life, he still had the knack of achieving his goal of godhood, but would tragically end by a godlike human of Wesker's caliber. Despite that setback, your creation still holds great significance. <coughs> now my candle burns dimly. Uh, ironic, isn't it? For one who has the right to be a god. To face his own mortality. The right to be a god. That right is now mine. Though enough of the villains dying a sad and tragic death in RE5, because in Resident Evil 6, again with Chris Redfield having one of the main roles in this game, here we're introduced to his partner, Pierce Nevins, with both characters going through their own ups and downs, especially with Chris. Pierce. Pierce Nevins? I never heard of you. How about this? You heard of this? What is that? You really don't remember anything, do you? Bioterrorism. your past, Chris. No matter where you go or what you do. Who are you? What is this? Okay. You don't remember me? Well, how about that? Look. I said look! Those were your men. Men who died under your command. You owe it to them to remember, Chris. If you walk away now, then this was all for nothing. Six months of searching for you, and this is what I find. But Pierce was known to have helped Chris when he hit rock bottom, always having his captain's back when things become dire. While throughout their journey in Resident Evil 6, the two did manage to take a whole lot of B.O.W.s down, but unfortunately for Pierce, a moment that would severely wound him would have him in the spotlight of being the tragic character that dies in RE6. Because after receiving his injuries, he, like the many enemies that we fought, would be infected with a C virus. Well, in the last ditch effort of the two trying to escape, would only be changed with this moment. <laughs> Also the fact that during the attack on Chris's escape pod by the B.O.W. Chaos, that large surge of electricity coming from the underwater facility indicates that Pierce had one last attack that saved Chris's life, giving his captain another day to fight against the many more monsters and strains.
while moving on to the next main title sequel, which would be in Resident Evil 7, with the tragic deaths in this game actually happening with the Baker family. Though this may come as a surprise to some since they'd played mostly as antagonists in this game, but a small vision cutscene explains their dire situation with the mold strain and the bioweapon Evelyn. Hey, shh, shh, I know, I know, I know. I'm not gonna hurt you. Hell, I never would have if I could have helped you. What do you mean? I'm no killer, son. Neither is Marguerite, nor my boy Lucas, or even Zoe here. That girl, Evelyn, she did this. What the hell is she? Now, what did she do to you? She infected us with her gift. That's what she calls it. I found her near a busted out tank in the bayou. Everything changed after that. So she infects you and then she takes control? No. Not exactly, son. She just... She forces a way into your mind, your soul. You can't fight back. You are connected to her, and you can't resist the urge to. Oh, you're a, you're a different person after that. Just like Mia. So Mia sent me that message because of Evelyn. Listen, the, the girl just wants a family of her own. She's the key, all right? You find her. You stop her. Ethan. Free my family. Please. In the end, the Baker family, just like our main protagonist Ethan Winters, were also victims themselves, because once infected with the mole strain, they would lose all control of their personality, constantly tormented by Evelyn's desire of a family, and showing erroneous acts of lunacy towards Ethan. So even when we take them down one by one, we all just have to remember that they were innocent but placed in a terrible situation, causing them to be the crazy family that we saw them to be. Come see her gift. Look at all the pretties my little girl is giving me! <laughs> Kiss me, lover! <laughs> Get to the garage! Get some rope! Go now! Stop it! Don't you worry. It's a whole lot worse than it looks. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and you're not even fucking close to meeting him right now. She wants me to do this. I have to show her how to hold me to him. She wants us all to show her our love. Daddy! Well, you don't want to disappoint her now, do you? We can't do that. What are you talking about? Your new sister, Eve. <laughs> Well, with Resident Evil 7's tragic death covered, this now brings us to the current main title in the series with Resident Evil Village. So spoilers ahead if you haven't played this game yet, because the sad and tragic death of the character we'll be discussing is actually Ethan Winters and his death that happens two times in this game, which may make you question how in the world did Ethan die twice in one game. Well, in the latter half of RE Village, we encounter the main antagonist, Mother Miranda. Here in this moment, she gives us a small exposition of her knowledge and plans. But by the end of it, she does this. Don't worry. Your death will come quick. You will join the Megamycetes records. I will make sure to sample your blood for now. Once dawn breaks, the ceremony will be complete, and I will become her true mother, bound for eternity in blood. <laughs> I've waited so long, but dreams really can. 
I can't wait to see my true child. Well, in a normal circumstance, this would have definitely been the end for Ethan. Well, through some revelations, we find out that Ethan has been a mold being this whole time. So all the injuries or any fatal blows that he's been dealt with was medicated due to the mold strain. Well, once this revelation was revealed, Ethan would wake up from his supposed death and would have one final confrontation with Mother Miranda, which Ethan comes out victorious, but with some repercussions. Because if we look closely, after the mold that surrounds Mother Miranda starts to crumble, it appears that Ethan's hands starts to crumble as well, indicating his finite time left in this world. While in the final act to save his loved ones, he would have to stay behind to activate a bomb that Chris Redfield planted on the Megamyce, giving us one last look from Ethan's perspective, showing his last moments prior to the bomb's detonation. <sighs> So in the end, Ethan's sacrifice allowed Chris and the rest of his family to escape the village, becoming a true hero and like peers from RE6, allowing Chris to fight another day. Anyways, what are your guys' thoughts about the ending in Resident Evil Village and which tragic and sad death in the main Resident Evil titles had the most impact? Please let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Also, if you guys enjoy the content, then please feel free to like and subscribe for more Resident Evil videos in the future. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching, and as always, you guys have a great rest of your day. This is Hey Deva, and I'll see you guys on the next video. What's going on? Where? down. Where is he? Chris? What have you done? He's gone. I tried. He stayed so we could all escape. I'm sorry.